obviously you're one of our featured composers on the 7th of November as mm -hmm. part of the Sydney International Women's Jazz Festival. So it's really great to be able to talk to you. Uh, we're featuring your piece, uh, Night Song. So I was just wondering if you could maybe start off by telling us a little bit about the piece, perhaps. Sure. Um, Night Song came off of uh, the first album I ever made, which was in 2017, I think, or 2016. Um, and it was an album I wrote uh, with music all inspired by the paintings of my father. Um, so it's, uh, it seems so long ago, I was saying yeah. last time we spoke that I hardly uh, like feel like it's mine at this point because I um, have done so much since then, but it's so nice that you guys are reviving the song. And so can you tell us a little bit about the painting perhaps? Oh yes, uh -huh. yeah, Night Song is a huge painting. Uh, my dad's an abstract painter. His style has changed a, a lot over the years, but at that particular time, I think that painting's from the early nineties, um, he was into super, super detailed, but like massive work. So this painting's probably like 10 feet across um, and like pointillistically detailed. It must've taken him so long to make it. Uh, so Night Song is, it's very a very frenetic painting if you look at it from far away, it kind of looks more like a wash of um, earthy colors. But if you look at it close, there's tons of crazy things going on inside of it. And how does that reflect perhaps in the sound world that you're you sort of When I was writing that piece, I was imagining um, a cityscape kind of sound, like an urban environment. Um, where there's so many voices that you can't delineate any of the words that are being said, but it kind of becomes this textural other thing. Um, and how did you approach yeah. making the piece? Did you start with composition or improvisation? Uh, I started with composition or improvising with myself, I guess, which is usually <laughs> how one writes. <laughs> um, and for that project, most of what I the way I was approaching the writing was based in color. Um, so I spent a lot of time at the piano trying to just find color, um, which was easy for like, I feel like the natural color sounds are, are, are like blue and green and maybe purple, but the red mm. um, more earth tones were hard for me. So. It was a lot of me calling the calling the drummer from our band and being like, "What color is this?" <laughs> and seeing if you'd get it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, great. And so last time we chatted, we were talking a little bit about the Vancouver scene. So I thought that might be interesting for people elsewhere, maybe watching mm. at some point, if you can tell us a little bit about that sort of what's happening in terms of the improvised creative music scene in Vancouver pre-pandemic, of course. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, pre-pandemic. <laughs> um, we have a quite a little vibrant scene here. It's kind of, um, it's small uh, and maybe a bit insular sometimes, but um, there's a lot of really good creative improvisers here. And I think we kind of have a distinct sound too. Um, so most of, our music gets made in small DIY spaces. Um, most medium sized music venues don't really exist anymore in Vancouver, unfortunately. Um, or like I was explaining to you last time, the ones that do still exist have live music from like seven till 9.30 and then flip and turn into a club, which is a bit of a bummer. <laughs> Uh, but we do what we can. Um, more and more, I think, house shows and stuff happening too here. Yeah, you were saying there were sort of some crazy bylaws that uh, sort of contributed to the yeah. live music decrease. Yes. What's been your experience with that? Uh, well, I think a, a lot of like venues closing has to do with real estate prices and rent prices and also um, our laws around liquor licensing um, in order to get a primary liquor license, they only have like a certain number of them. So you have to wait for a bar to close basically to get one. Um, and for non-primary liquor licenses, it's easier to get, but it's still 
still not uh, an easy task by any means. So a lot of the venues are under, under, underground. Um, and then there's really stupid noise bylaws that um, get in the way of things sometimes, like my life. <laughs> I love to complain about it because it's screwed me over a bit. Um, I run a house concert series from my front yard for the past seven years and increasingly have been getting a lot of hostility from the city around that because uh, no, uh, any sound, any sound, it could be the sound of my voice that can be heard off of the perimeter of your property at any time. It doesn't matter what time it is. If it's complained about it, you're violating the bylaw, which is insane. Really? So. Wow, yeah. so somebody could be having an argument with somebody and yeah. the neighbor complains. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of relatable uh, to sort of what's happening in major cities here in Australia, because we were talking about that last time. Mm -hmm. There's this hyperinflated real estate price sort of yeah. everywhere has made it quite difficult for a lot of alternative venues, also in Sydney and Melbourne and different places. Yeah, it's interesting the uh, ideas or solutions people are coming up with. I thought your um, front yard music series was great, um, but I, I don't know how that would go here. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's been really fun. This year we actually did it differently because um, of COVID. I, and we had to cancel. I, I scheduled two and I canceled one because I was getting threatened to be fined from the city for violating the noise bylaw and also um, threatened around COVID restrictions, which we were following, but it just was a little too sketchy. But we, I found two other houses in my neighborhood to host in their yards and we had like a, a concert crawl. So there are three different groups of audience that traveled between the houses that each had a, a musical act which is really fun format. I kind of want to try again when it's a little easier to do things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think people enjoy sort of walking. I've, I've done that. Yeah. Before in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in Vancouver at the moment? You were saying there was sort of a radical spike in cases. So sort of yeah, BC's or all of Canada actually is having maybe what is a second wave. Yeah. Um, so things haven't locked down yet, but it might kind of seems like it's moving in that direction. Bars have a curfew of 10. Um, and I think everyone's just obviously like, you don't want to be responsible for something bad happening. So yeah. in terms of cultural events, things could, were happening a bit over the summer because we could be outside, but now it's cold and raining. So, and things are getting a little more freaky. So yeah, not much going on. Is there sort of a lot of collaboration between Toronto and Vancouver in, in Canada between? The uh, and yeah, I think under normal circumstances um, across all of Canada, even though it's a huge landmass, um, this the it, we have a small population so especially in the creative music scene every i feel like everybody in canada kind of knows each other in some way or another um which is really nice um and it's it's hard to tour across canada from vancouver because there's a big chunk in the middle before you hit any kind of bigger city with an art scene but people do it uh mm -hmm. And I certainly, I go, usually go back and forth between Vancouver a couple of times a year. Um, I really love the people in the music scene there. Great. And how would you sort of contrast or describe the two scenes? Are they quite different or similar in some ways? Um, I think it's definitely, I mean, Toronto's a much bigger city than Vancouver. So it's way, it has more venues. It's way easier to book a show. Um, I think they run into kind of the same frustrations around like high rent and people being too busy because they're trying to make a dollar. And um, it seems a bit, a little bit more political over there. <laughs> um, sometimes uh, from my experience anyways, uh, Vancouver, I mean, every, every scene has its politics, but I think because we're smaller, it's kind of more 
family vibes here. Yeah. Okay. And maybe can you tell us a little bit about how you got into sort of your creative music uh, journey or? Yeah. Um, Hear from different people sort of. Yeah. I was classically trained harpist from like age nine until I found myself in a classical music program in university um, and realized that it's like 300% incompatible with my personality to be doing that uh but I didn't really know what else to do (laughs) so I I had a pretty bad time in music school just being like what am I doing and I and my last year of school started to get to know the creative uh music scene here Mm -hmm. um and that was really special important time to be like okay this is where I belong Mm -hmm. um so I started improvising then and then of course like graduated art school and felt like I didn't know anything and had I'm sure the process that everybody goes through (laughs) uh but since then I've I have hardly played any classical music um and have my career is very focused on creative uh music I feel so lucky I get to do that yeah, it's interesting talking to um, a lot of the women actually um, that we're featuring in this program. A lot have a similar story. There are some mm. that have really just come out of jazz, but a lot have a similar story myself as well, sort of coming from a classical background, but having very eclectic taste. Mm-hmm. And at that point, classical doesn't really just um, enable you to do everything that your personality is capable yes. of. Um, yes. so it was interesting, actually, there's quite a few uh, big band composers, Izzy Barrett in the UK, sort of had a similar story. Cool. And um, myself and Keena Wilkins, who's also playing in the show on piano. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting to hear the similarities, sort of people think they're going on their own journey, but um, there are usually quite a few other people somewhere yeah, in the world definitely. having <laughs> yeah. a, similar, a similar journey. Yeah. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about new projects coming up for yourself? Yeah, I've got a lot going on right now, actually. Luckily, Mm -hmm. um, when COVID started, I applied for every grant possible (laughs) and I got a bunch of them, which is really fun. So I just recorded an album on the weekend with a group called Gentle Party. Um, So we'll be finishing that up and releasing that in the spring. Um, I have a duo project called The Giving Shapes that's with a pianist and we are going to be devising a show that's with a shadow puppetry duo called Mind of a Snail which I'm really excited about too and I also will be writing um, a song cycle that's based off of my great aunt's poetry. She was a um, pretty prolific famous Canadian poet in the prairies and like the 70s through 90s Mm -hmm. um so I'll be working with BJ Iyer as a mentor on that project uh writing a body of music for that I think that's kind of all (laughs) right and so did did you meet um BJ uh, through Banff or how did you yeah I met him at the jazz program there five years ago maybe and I was supposed to go um to a program he was running at the Atlanta Atlantic center uh in may and i was so excited there was only going to be like seven or eight of us for three weeks on a beach in florida a beach in florida uh (laughs) but obviously that got cancelled so i'm really happy that i'll get to be working on something with him yeah i think banff is a really special place have you had sort of much to do with banff over your career it is a very special place yeah i've been there um three times Mm -hmm. uh two for their self-directed residencies and once for the jazz program so talking about Lilith Knight obviously your piece will be featured on the 7th of November and uh, it's a women collective featuring women composers from around the world but also our own music so we were Mm -hmm. saying last time obviously Lilith Knight um it's not just a band we wanted to start it sort of as a network to be able to collaborate so the music will travel first and then <laughs> hopefully later yes. and then our bodies yeah, yeah. 
um, that's the idea. And uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, how you approach composition? But you sort of touched on that with Night Song, but is it sort of similar when you're working on projects or do you have a um, different way of sort of getting in? Uh, I usually always it's at the piano or most of the time is at the piano which is interesting because I'm actually not like very good at piano <laughs> but um I like chromatic music and it's just much easier to kind of navigate through those things without thinking too hard before moving on to the harp where everything's really hard <laughs> um so lately it's just been um at the piano and I don't really have to think too hard and things just come out, but that's not always the case. So when it's not, uh, I like to kind of seek inspiration from other mediums, which is where Night Song came from and that whole project um, or texts, I really love um, digging into. And I feel I actually for a while, a lot of my instrumental music actually had like secret lyrics that I wrote the melodies too but it wasn't meant to be sung but actually the the next album that Hugh put out which is the project that put out Night Song um we put out the instrumental album and then I put out another EP that has some of the tunes with with a singer singing singing the secret lyrics ah, there you <laughs> yeah go. okay yeah I'll have to listen to that one yeah. um and of course, the Sydney International Women's Jazz Festival is celebrating women in jazz and women in music. Um, so could you maybe tell us a little bit about your experience or perspective of that and maybe also in Canada, sort of what's happening in Canada around that issue and what you've sort of experienced in your career about that? Yeah, um, it's not perfect yet, but it's getting better. Yeah. Um, there's a huge difference from even like, you know, five to seven years ago about how women are treated um, and and organizations making an effort for equity. Um, I think kind of the work that needs to be done still is is like the deep-seated mind shifts that need to happen. I was telling you a story that I feel like is worth saying again because yeah. the more I think about it the more pissed off I am about it. I ran into somebody who I uh, had worked with a few years ago, who was a high school teacher, uh, and I was running an outreach program via one of our arts organizations called the Western Front at his school. And I ran into him and I was like, oh, actually, I, or I met him through somebody. And I said, oh, actually, we've met before this project, blah, blah, blah. I said a lot of things like, I was working with you. My boss said this. like. And at the end of the conversation, he asked me if I graduated high school in 2015. Because yeah. he just didn't listen to anything that I was saying and assumed that I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> um, so stuff like that happens all the time. Um, yeah. I remember also like maybe two years ago at the Jazz Fest here, which is a really, the Jazz Fest, Coastal Jazz is really amazing and wonderful people run it. and. They're very woke around these kind of topics, but there was some French guys who were performing and we were all in the green. I think I actually played with one of them. Anyways, at the end of the night in the green room, French guy comes up to me and he's like, this is amazing. Canada has women that play jazz. We don't have that in France. Oh my gosh. Wow. I was like, excuse me. Yes, you do. You're an idiot. Uh, so, you know. There are I'm lots sure. of women in France from I know. He was convinced. I had got into it with him and he, I was like, well, maybe that's because if that's the case, which I don't think it is, you probably have an education problem. And yeah. he's like, no, I'm a professor at a university. We just don't have women there. Like, you're, I can't even just yeah. get out of here. <laughs> I, I think this um, touches on a subject as well that is part of the whole changing the mind thing is the education part of it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, how we're taught in schools and in music schools or extracurricular programs is still very much based around male patriarchal Western history. So I think we need to be starting to bring in sort of an equality uh, between sort of the material that we're presenting kids 
Totally. Um, because it, it's also through my own education work, I'm quite astounded sometimes when kids come to you and you're sort of working in an outreach program and they may be seven, eight, nine, ten, and they already have very concrete, fixed ideas about yeah. gender. And for me, that's always really quite astounding because they have to learn it somewhere. And it's obviously learned very early, very uh, early in our yeah. society. And, um, but I mean, even um, like last year when we started with the Little of Night program and I was sort of curating the pieces, it was quite interesting. Um, we only had two composers out of the whole program that actually had children. And mm. this year I was able to find more women composers that actually were working mm. Uh, while having children um, and that seems to be something that's changing now but that wasn't always the case and I mean oh, we, yeah. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s and it was still very much then for freelance women uh, regardless of what profession it, it was still an issue I don't know what that's like in Canada these days but uh, child um, care out of school child care is quite expensive in Australia I really Here too depends, yeah it's very expensive depends on the country where you're living in terms of how that's possible and there are women here who have children but generally they come from well-to-do families yeah uh, where the totally. parents have been able to buy them houses or support them in that way um, and or the family are living close by which means they have an inbuilt free network of support um, so I think that really depends on the country that you come from, but a lot of people underestimate how much that influences. Oh my God, it's huge. Produce. This is, yeah. um, so I think countries or organizations, obviously they need to approach the, uh, the representation thing in terms of festivals and concert venues, at least 50, 50, but there also needs to be a systemic uh, sort of approach. And this is not just about the arts, but it's really yeah. that, these are basic things that should have already been uh, talked about or approached or resolved. It's incredible, isn't it? I think in 2020, <laughs> right? So it's, yeah. And it's still, a, it's still a question that women have to ask and men don't have to ask this question. There I know. are countless quotes in history of, you know, famous women saying that like a man doesn't have to ask, uh, yeah. do I choose between career or children? It, it, it's not something he has to think about. But it's, it's still something we have to think about today, I think. Um, and so can you tell me, do you know anything sort of about other organizations in Canada that have perhaps specific programs that are working? Yeah, um, I, was, I was explaining to you last time I spoke, um, SOCAN, which is our licensing organization, has a number of programs and grants for women. Um, there's also like cool little festivals and stuff popping up that are focused on presenting women. Um, one that was really neat that was my last my last thing before COVID was um, I played at a little festival called Women from Space in Toronto that had a really awesome lineup. Um, little things like that, but nothing huge actually. Comments, I'm sure you've gotten them too when you're like, oh, I'm a musician. So you're a singer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm going to do, this is another project I'm going to do a book right with all of these quotes from women yeah. musicians because there are plenty yeah. sort of yes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it's interesting so there's still a long way yeah. to go and um, referring to the story that you had about the male musician it was sort of similar to uh, some colleagues that I spoke to about that as well not all male musicians are the same but yes. uh, some male musicians that I had spoken to about the topic of women in music and the, um, the affront that you get in return is quite amazing, I think, for 2020. Yeah. Uh, by some, not all, but by some uh, colleagues that uh, I thought were really quite progressive, that basically mm. there isn't a problem. I don't understand why all of this, you know, topic oh, is yeah. going on. It's basically we've been getting a gig because they're women. I'm like, well, that sort of happened for a long time <laughs> <laughs> if we turn the tables around uh, in the other direction. Uh, and yeah. they, their comment was basically there just aren't women in music. And, but this all comes from the whole programs, right? Because you have to have female teachers for female students to feel comfortable. Uh, yeah. You have a lot of yeah. women in their 50s now that have had to come through an environment where it was just all male. And that's yeah. from mentors to colleagues, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a great initiative happening right now out of Toronto, led by um, some faculty members of a few of the different uh, 
schools there called This Is Art School, and they're fighting for some systemic change around how the universities are approaching yeah. their policy. But it's, uh, they're having, I think it's getting easier. They started this maybe a, f um, a few months ago. Um, and I had a friend who was like, do I need to leave my job at the University of Toronto because the university is handling this so badly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, they're still quite underrepresented in terms of yeah. university positions in the jazz creative music. Yeah. I find. yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll see what happens. Um, but all we can do is get women on stage. That's the main thing. Uh, yeah, women, totally. get women on stage and um, start coming up with your own programs. And, and that was the thing that came out, I think, uh, of a lot of the interviews is that mm -hmm. as a female instrumentalist, it's up to you, basically. It's very few female instrumentalists are employed as sidemen in. Yes, yeah, and you have to do it all. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's sort of women trying to, they have to promote their own projects. They have to create their own projects. Uh, and then they have to sort of run a house as well on top yes. of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No problem. <laughs> it was great to talk to you, Elisa. Um, we're really looking forward to playing your piece. Um, so we'll- yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. We'll see what happens there. We're, we're also interested to see sort of how it develops. Um, but we were talking about last time how that sort of effect that you were talking about, that soundscape effect can transfer over into the lineup we have, which is clarinet, trumpet, uh, piano and drums. Yes. Some electronic uh, pedal sort of- Yeah. Effect and these sorts of things. Totally. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it. Great. Yeah, and we have your painting. So your dad's painting will be up. Uh, so yes, beautiful. And what's your dog's name? Oh, this is Jax. Yes. I just yeah. really know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. And also to Meredith, obviously, for contacting us. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so nice to talk to you. I can't wait to yeah. see what you put together. <laughs>